Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a challenge. They're all challenging. Should we shut up <laughs> now, Jeff? So we, you, uh, or Mike? Yeah, Jeff. Jeff, do you want to come back in? Not yet. I'm here. It's uh, there's Mike. Yeah, I'm here too. Oh, we're, we're we're just about where we're at. I just was waiting for everyone else to zip up and get back here. Doctor Z has a story about getting one of his last countries while working from an apartment. I think. Or it was uh, QC. Having losing the big antenna, doing their one big one big waiting countries from the apartment. Thank you, guys. So I see Mr. Dana here thinking about what he's doing. Jeff, can you hand control over to Dana and I will just talk him in? Yeah, I think Dana should be able to present. I made some changes to the settings here. So uh, Dana, if you want to give it a shot to see if you can share your screen. Oh yeah, okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, your audio is just fine. Oh, good, okay. Let me just uh, check this out. <clears throat> okay share okay can you guys see that yep you got a slide deck on the left and the slide on the front uh-huh okay um all right let me just uh kick this into slideshow <clears throat> so just while he's doing the little brief sir i'll say uh so mr ele uh and a whole bunch of people dana was involved in this little fox hunt we ran to find what was going on with uh all kinds of fun. And that was part of Andy's crew finding uh, wonderful little uh, total station GPS things that were causing grief. So uh, Dana writes a column in TCA uh, about the VHF world. So he's a big VHF fan. And he's uh, part of the Southern Ontario DX Association and generally plays around in anything in VHF that can ever come along. So here we'll have him give us a little talk when he's ready to go. Over to you, Mr. Shum. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thanks very much and good evening to everybody. Nice to see some familiar faces in there. Um, I just want to just want to comment. There was a comment about the uh, VHF contest and it's the it, June the 12th. It's the ARRL's annual June VHF QSO party. And it covers uh, all bands from 50 megahertz up. <clears throat> and uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, get on and uh, try, you know, try that rig that's been collecting dust in the, in, on the, on the shelf uh, on, on the VHF bands. So, and uh, you just never know what's going to happen in June. You can get uh, local contacts around the GTA here. And then all of a sudden the band will open out to California on six meters or to the Gulf of Mexico on, or Florida on two meters and two twenties. So, uh, one never knows what's going to happen. So, and you can also uh, wind up uh, getting a nice, nice, uh, nice plaque. I don't know if that's going to. Show Not too up. close. Back up a bit. Yeah. <clears throat> there, you're in focus there. The magic focal spot. Anyway, you get a nice plaque if you uh, have fun too from the ARL. So. Uh, uh, it's a, it's the primo contest that's been going on for uh, many, many decades and uh, the more the merrier. So by all means, uh, keep June the 12th and 13th open and, uh, and uh, get on if you got an FM rig, if you got a sideband rig, if you got a CW or FT8, doesn't matter, just get on and, and work some guys, you know, have some fun. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I guess tonight we're going to do a little presentation here about uh, meteor scatter, and that's one of the uh, one of the interesting aspects of VHF operating that uh, allows you to extend your range well beyond the horizon on uh, 
on our bands above 50 megahertz. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into a little bit of an introduction here for everybody tonight. <clears throat> if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to break in and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully be able to, uh, to answer them. So, uh, so meteors, hey, you know, I think everybody's seen uh, or heard about uh, uh, meteors. Uh, we've had a few, uh, <clears throat> a few um, events over the last few months where uh, people have seen, uh, seen meteors come in uh, and uh, um, they've actually found bits of them on the ground at some locations. And what it is, is it's cosmic material. It's all the stuff that was left over from the, um, from the creation of our solar system that's been floating around in space for billions of years. Um, and this stuff is raining down on us every, uh, as, as we go around the sun, where it, it stuff is being pulled in and rains down on us. And it, it's coming in at high speed, 17,000 to 120,000 miles an hour. And when that stuff hits the atmosphere, it gets hot from the friction of, of traveling at that speed into the atmosphere and, uh, and burns up. And that's what you see if you're, if you're out and you see a, a shooting star. <clears throat> it's that material coming in. And we, we get hit with 200 tons roughly of that material every day here, here on Earth. Uh, there was a little uh, article in the, uh, on, on the internet saying some of that stuff was coming from the dust storms on Mars. So, um, you know, you never know where this stuff has been, but it's coming in. <clears throat> and um, typically a lot of this stuff is very small grains, sand, grains of sand, very tiny, not very big. Um, but every once in a while we get those big pieces coming in and they can be pretty destructive uh, because they can create a sonic boom or, or a severe shock wave at those speeds. Um, and there was one that came in uh, over Russia a few years back that uh, actually blew out windows and um, set off uh, car burglar alarms and stuff like that. So, you know, it can be pretty, uh, pretty destructive, but uh, Fortunately, that doesn't happen too often, and, uh, and we can make use of all that small stuff that's coming in. <clears throat> so the ham radio operators have been hearing meteor scatter for decades. Back in the old days, uh, before World War II, um, there were lots of reports in QST about strange noises, you know, hear, heard on, on 10 meters way up on that huge BHF band up at 28 megahertz, and even higher <clears throat> on that almost impossible to get to five meter band. Um, and uh, they called them Doppler wizards because uh, you know, they, they, they would hear uh, bits of signal come in and it would have a Doppler shift on it because of the, um, the, the fact that the, the meteors are coming in from uh, say moving from north to south or east to west and, and uh, setting up um, <clears throat> propagation in such a way that, uh, that it ca causes a Doppler shift on the signal. So everybody was like, what is this? You know, we, we got to find out what that is. And it actually stimulated a lot of uh, exploratory uh, uh, work uh, before the war and after the war um, to try and identify what this was and, and find out if we could actually make use of it. Um, a lot of the a lot of the work was done in in California at um, some of the universities down there and uh, and also out on the East Coast. So there's a here's a picture of one uh, one experimental setup on 10 meters where they were uh, trying to um, trying to track this stuff back in the back in the 40s. <clears throat> so you know, like meteors are coming in and they're creating. These, these trails of ionized gases as the, as the stuff comes in and burns up. And it's those trails of ionized gas that actually produce the, um, the, 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 the medium for propagation. And, and this all occurs up in, in the, um, up in the ionosphere about 50 miles above ground. Um, <clears throat> and um, and it's, it also depends on how fast these piece, pieces of material are coming in. 
um, where they burn up, but it's typically within a 25 mile zone from, from 50 to 75 miles above ground. And, um, and it's basically the same idea as, as HF propagation. You're, you're reflecting your signal off an ionized layer. And on the lower bands, of course, we have the ionosphere, we have uh, the F layer, and, <clears throat> and typically those reflect uh, VHF, uh, HF signals quite readily, as everybody was talking about working. Uh, George, I think you mentioned uh, you, were, you worked all continents except uh, Antarctica the other day on, on HF. Well, it's, it's the same, same mechanics, but uh, at the higher frequencies, uh, it's much more difficult because the uh, maximum usable frequency is not anywhere near six meters, typically these days at, at this point in the solar cycle anyway. Um, but with the meteor scatter signals that actually creates little tiny areas of ionization that is, you know, at that higher maximum usable frequency. So, so it, uh, it, 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 it's sort of a, a ready-made way of, of getting propagation out, out to, 1,200, 2,400 miles easily. So um, typical distances, 1,000, 1,300 miles on, on, on two meters. On six meters, it can be a, a lot further because it's lower frequency, um, <clears throat> but that's the, your typical range. Um, and you can get uh, double hot meteors as well, sometimes during meteor showers, if you're really lucky. You might get uh, you might get two meteors coming in at just the right time and the right position that it creates a double a double signal. So uh, you could be trying to work somebody in the Midwest and somebody in California could come in. Uh, you might see that on six meters. On the higher frequencies, it's much more difficult. Um, ionization levels, as I said, can change with the velocity of the the meteors coming in. Um, Sometimes the meteors come in fairly slowly, and sometimes they, uh, and when they do, they don't burn up as high in the ionosphere. They'll burn up lower down. And of course, as you get closer to the ground, your 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 maximum range will uh, will diminish. Um, if you get just the right size and the right speed, you can get a an ionization layer that hangs up there for a long period of time. And we call those blue wizards because. They'll create like mini openings that, that will last maybe a minute or two. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that go into that as well. There's, there's some rapid fading sometimes and Doppler shifts. So you have to, you have to be uh, pretty on the ball to be able to catch some of this stuff. Uh, if you're working on single sideband, um, on, on digital modes, it's, uh, it's not quite that, uh, that difficult, but it, it's certainly interesting on, on CW or sideband or, uh, or digital. So just some things about meteors. Uh, meteor people talk about the radiant and the, the radiant is uh, typically um, where, the, uh, where the meteors seem to be coming from uh, in the sky, and those typically are associated with uh, constellations. Um, and uh, and as as the Earth goes around, um, as the Earth goes around the uh, the Sun, uh, we travel through these clouds of dust and 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 stuff that are and stuff that is also orbiting with us. And the radiant is, is where the point in the sky where the meteors seem to be coming from. Um, and there are some handy tools for, for setting this up. Uh, we, we have meteor showers that happen throughout the year. And uh, there's one tool here called Virgo that uh, is, is pretty handy for being able to determine where in the sky the meteors are coming from. So you just plug in your grid square on this side. And um, it'll show you in the sky where where the uh, the shower is coming from, and, and and that changes, of course. You know, the, you know the sun comes up and travels across the sky and then sets, and the moon comes up and travels across the sky and sets. And it's the same thing with these meteor showers. As the Earth's going around, the, the meteor shower will appear to rise. 
uh, above the horizon in one location and then gradually move through the uh, move through the sky and then set. And, and this tool will show where, where that is. So this, this point here is directly overhead. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if, you, if you want to picture this, um, uh, your, these are your horizons here. So you know, if, you're, if you're standing out in the backyard and looking straight up, um, you'd be able to, uh, if you could take this, this blue circle and put it up above you, you'd be able to orient it in such a way that um, that you could see where where in the sky the shower is at any one time. So it's a pretty handy tool. But that's the, that's the neat thing about ham radio. You know, you, you get some of these things, and then somebody says, "Well, you know, uh, you know, back in the old days, uh, back well, the old days. George knows what the old days are. Like back in the seventies. <laughs> We used to draw these things on cardboard and draw them out and, and look, bring out tables of, of charts and books with, with calculations that have been pre-done and printed. And then you had to translate them all into, onto cardboard charts and draw them out and then hold them up over your head. And with, these, uh, with the arrival of these uh, infernal uh, computers, you know, some smart hams decided they were gonna do something better than this. So, so this is one of the tools, you know, just makes life so much easier. And, um, and there's just no end of stuff on the internet for, for this kind of thing too. So keep that in mind, it just Google, Google meteor showers and all kinds of stuff will come up. So I came up through the 1970s uh, when I, I first got my license in 1969 and did my first meteor scatter contact uh, <clears throat> um, from, from a friend of mine's house, uh, out in Etobicoke and uh, who, who was set up to do that. And that was it. I just, I had to do this stuff. So uh, next thing I know, I was putting antennas up and, and stuff and doing all this. So it was all, all pretty amazing. But at that time it was all on CW or, or SSB. So uh, um, it was quite different than today. Anyway, uh, here's, a, here's a quick drawing here. Um, the, one of the major showers is the Perseids, and that uh, typically occurs every year around August 12th, which is my birthday, by the way, too. So, you know, it's double special for me. But, uh, but it, um, it, it it's uh, it's a a bunch of dust that circles the uh, the sun. It's uh, it's associated with the orbit of uh, comet Swift Tuttle. Um, <clears throat> so Swift Tuttle is going around the, the sun, the same thing as the Earth. Um, and it's gradually falling apart. It's, it's, it's a comet. So it, it's, there's a lot of dust and stuff that comes off these things. And, and as they go around the sun, they gradually start to fall apart and all this stuff flies off and, and orbits along with the, the meteor, uh, along, along with the comet. And then the earth comes along and goes through that cloud of dust. And when we go through that cloud of dust, that's what causes all the meteors. So, um, so I think the, the Americans uh, and the Japanese have actually gone, gone to some of these uh, comets and, and uh, have been able to uh, capture material off these things. And, and one, of them, one of them's on the way back now, but uh, um, <clears throat> it, um, it was uh, found to be like a loose agglomerate of gravel basically you know, pulled into a, a big ball, but uh, when you hit it, it, it's all loose and all this stuff flies off. So, uh, so that's, that's what triggers a lot of these things. So, so we're, we're, we're lucky in that regard to have um, comets like this that are, that are orbiting. Um, <clears throat> but we also have to be careful because if we get in the wrong place at the wrong time, we could go the way of the dinosaurs, you know, it, uh, that's a concern too. Um, so we live in an interesting neighborhood here and around the sun. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to make use of this for many, many years and not get wiped out. But uh, uh, we'll just have to take our chances. Anyway, um, yeah, list of major meteor showers. Here's, here's a list of, uh, this says 1920, but I updated it to 1921. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we, we just had the Eta Aquarids uh, May the 5th. Um, and uh, we'll be looking forward to the Perseids in August. And uh, 
and these other showers uh, through the uh, through the years. The Leonids are good. The Geminids are good, um, and the Perseids are really good. These other ones are, you know, not maybe they vary from year to year. Sometimes uh, they produce a lot of meteors. Sometimes they don't. Um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, the, the the peak meteors are in the southern hemisphere or um, on the other, you know, over Europe and then nothing over North America. And sometimes it's the other way around. So, so it's, um, it's something that you have to really watch every year and, and check on the data to see where, where things are. And again, that's where the internet all comes in handy. <clears throat> and every once in a while we get uh, meteor storms. Um, the Leonids in 1966, for instance, we had 150,000 meteors per hour. So basically that lit up the, the VHF band and, and turned two meters into what sounded like 20 meters because uh, it was just continual bombardment of stuff and ionization everywhere um, over, over North America. And that, that enabled uh, uh, everybody to be able to communicate just like on 10 or 20 meters. So uh, it was uh, pretty amazing. Um, I had something. Sorry? Could I add something? Yeah. I was about four years old in a bedroom looking west, northwest as a kid watching just these amazing streaks of light in the sky. I didn't know what they were at the time, but I was fascinated by them. It was around oh. the Presidio's time, but it was an amazing light show that I haven't seen since. Yeah. And I, don't, and I don't think it was 66. I would have been 10 years old and I would have known about meteors by then. Uh-huh. Anyway, I'm just saying that it was one amazing light show, and I've never seen it. I've yeah, seen well, it. you know, there have been some other ones too, like the Leonids, uh, 2004, I think it was. Uh, um, we had uh, we had a, a huge uh, showing then too. So, uh, <clears throat> and then the Perseids. The Perseids used to, up until about 1998, the Perseids were pretty substantial. So you, you, you could see quite a few if you were sitting out in a dark, dark place at, at night in August. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the shower got, um, the, uh, the, the comet in the shower got uh, bumped a little bit by uh, Jupiter's gravity and it shifted things. So, so the last, uh, the, the, the shower deteriorated in terms of production because the, the cloud moved uh, away from the earth and uh, we, um, we weren't seeing quite as much uh, from the Perseids, but they seem to be coming back. So uh, um, might be, uh, it might be uh, pretty, pretty interesting to watch uh, if you've got a dark, uh, a dark backyard for, for that one. Cause it's all, you know, it's, it's always a, a nice evening. It's usually warm out and uh, it's, it's great to sit out in the chair and watch. Some of these other ones gets a little chilly out there. So you really have to be keen to, to sit out in the backyard when it's five degrees, you know, looking for meteors. But <laughs> anyway, that's part of the fun. And uh, so that's meteor showers. So there are there are other things going on too. As I mentioned, we we pick up all this dust that we're all, all the time as we're going around the sun, um, and. Uh, and, and that creates some interesting opportunities for what are known as random meteors. So, so here, the idea is to get on early in the morning before, before sunrise, um, typically on six meters, uh, and, and try and work, guys, uh, um, you know, to looking to, typically to the southwest, to the west uh, from here. Um, and, and the whole idea with this is the earth is going around, is, is rotating. And, and in the morning we're, we're, we're rotating in, in the direction of travel, if you will, of, of, of our orbit. So as we do that, as we're moving around the sun and then the earth is turning into, into, in following that direction, it increases the effective velocity that, uh, that, that the dust is coming in at. And, and again, it burns up. That mean, means it's burning up higher in the ionosphere. So it, it'll, it'll help propagate radio signals. Whereas as, as, uh, if you try and do that at night, um, 
the velocity is going to be much lower because uh, you're looking away from from the direction of travel. So the speed is going to the effective speed is going to drop. So you, typically you don't see a lot of meteor activity at night on random. So it's sort of a morning thing. Um, and interestingly enough, too, it follows a, 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 it follows a pattern um, through the year too. So the summer months typically uh, you'll find more more meteors uh, available at that time of year. And I think it's because of the tilt of the Earth, because we're we're then in in, in the um, in the winter our hemisphere is tilted away from. Um, away from the equator, whereas now in the summer, we're tilting towards, the, the earth is tilting towards the sun more. So, so we're actually tilting more into, the, into this stuff as we, go, as we go around. And then in winter, we're kind of moving away from it. So I thought that was interesting to see that. And, and, it, and, it, and it jives with, uh, with experience too. I mean, these, uh, these things have been tracked and and um, agglomerated to no end, so so it, uh, it it certainly produces some interesting results. And as I mentioned, uh, you know the amateurs have been looking at this stuff since the 30s, um, and a few of the uh, a few of the the well-known VHFers uh, really got together to try and do something organized in the 50s on two meters initially. Um, and uh, people like uh, W4HHK and W2AZL and W2UK uh, in New Jersey and, and uh, down in uh, the Carolinas, um, they, they, they set up uh, uh, SCEDs uh, to try and work each other over these distances uh, over a thousand mile path and mapped up, did a lot of this, the, the Joe work for mapping out these, uh, these showers and the directions and, and what you could work on two meters. And, and then they went and did it on 220 and also on 432. So, so we've got some interesting, uh, interesting history there. But, um, and that was, that was mostly on CW and SFSB. Now over in Europe, the Europeans took a slightly different perspective on this. They, uh, theorized, you know, a few of the guys got together and said, okay, well, you know, these little ionization paths, they, they don't last very long. So how can we, how can we make the most of it uh, in that time? And they came up with this interesting mechanical device, looked like a turntable. Um, and uh, I think if, if you, if you know, like, you know, these, um, these music boxes where you open them up and there's a disc or not a disc, but a drum in there with pins on it, and, and it goes around and and plucks, uh, you know, little little fingers that make a, a tone. Um, they they kind of took that idea and a, and turned it into a a turntable, like a flat turntable with pins on it, um, and then spun it really fast. So they were they were sending mechanical CW at twelve hundred words a minute. Um, using these gizmos. Now, I don't know about you, but there is no way I can copy 1200 words a minute on CW, okay? I kind of, like I have trouble at 40, you know, like, <laughs> you know, and, and 1200 is a little, a little too fast, but again, you know, smart guys, ah, I got a tape recorder. So what they were doing was, what they would do would be to record this stuff, that, you know, if they hear somebody record it and then, slow it down and then play it back on the tape recorder, low speed. So you can copy the CW, so you slow it right down. So it's not really real time, it's not really a real time QSO mechanism like, like the CW when you're sending or SSB when you're screaming in, into the microphone at two o'clock in the morning and waking the house up, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> but, uh, but still, you know, it. it proved uh, to be quite an efficient way of, of, of making contacts on, on, uh, on the bands up there. Um, and again, you know, technology changes. So along came computers and a few bright guys decided, you know, hey, maybe we can do something similar to that mechanical turntable using a computer. And uh, 
Doug V5UF and Andy K0SM and uh, uh, Shelby Ennis W8WN and others back in the 90s came up with, uh, with techniques to do that on the computer. And that sort of formed a basis for, for WSJT uh, and, and a lot of that digital stuff that, that we're using today um, was developed uh, by these guys back in the 90s. To, to work meteor scatter. And uh, here's some pictures of some of the guys. Uh, uh, K4IXC uh, down in Florida was one of my first meteor scatter contacts on two meters um, back in 1971. And uh, John was very, uh, was very big on meteors on, on two meters and on 220 megahertz uh, from Florida. He, uh, he had a huge signal. Um, I had a sked with him set up for the Perseids in August, and we actually worked on the 30th of, uh, of July, well before the meteor shower um, on two meter CW. So uh, uh, I says, says, we beat the shower this time. <laughs> so, so again, that was on random meteors on two meters. Um, and as I said, you know, they were, guys were experimenting on uh, on 220 and on 432, and they actually made contacts on 432 megahertz. Um, it took uh, it took I think about five hours of or 30 hours of continuous skeds for them to to be able to make that contact on 432. And again, you know, it's the maximum usable frequency it has to be up at 432 megahertz and it has to stay there long enough to be able to propagate a signal um, from one station to the other and then for the other station to send, you know, response back. So you're looking at maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Um, and, and at those frequencies, it's very, very difficult to, to be able to do that. And also the the spot, the ionization spot is very much smaller at 432. So you really got to be, you got to be really lucky to be able to work that at, at that frequency because the, the, the ionization path is small and the frequency of, of bits that burn up at that frequency are, <clears throat> are very, very much lower than at two meters or six meters. But they did it. And, um, and that too was was you know back in 1972. So the equipment too wasn't quite as as primo as the stuff we have today. Like our technology has moved along a great deal um, in terms of being able to hear signals, uh, being able to stay on frequency. You know you don't when you sneeze now your VFO doesn't wobble around. <laughs> Everything's GPS locked, so nothing wobbles. Um, but, uh, too, you know, like the receivers are so much more sensitive now to the noise, the noise figures are much lower. So, uh, um, it, it makes a huge difference. So that's uh, that's W0PS in Grafton, North Dakota, on two meters, um, and that's a recording of uh, of uh, Clint uh, during the Perseids um, back in in 1972, uh, and he uh, he had a, a huge signal in into Toronto on that. That was that was a purple wizard. That was that one lasted a long time. So so we didn't have any trouble working at all, but. Uh, um, that's how it's done on CW. So, you know, it, uh, you have to stay awake for that stuff. That's, that's the, uh, the coffee mode. That's at two o'clock in the morning when you've got the coffee with you or, um, or you're sending away and you start to doze off a little bit and then boom, you know, you get hit with the meteor burst and suddenly you're wide awake. Um, so it, uh, it, it's very, it, that whole mode was very hands-on at that time. And I think that was probably one of the, the, the really exciting things was actually to be able to hear somebody else's signal pop in from some distance away like that, which is pretty, 
pretty pretty exciting. Okay, so what that was is the Leonids in 2001, and that was uh, that was the meteor storm, and that was. Uh, that was K0GU in, in north of Denver, Colorado, on uh, on two meter sideband. And as you as you can hear, we were able to work, and he was able to work W8MIL as well on that one burst. So that burst uh, was good enough to support two contacts. Uh, and and that storm, it, it was like that all night. It was just just like just like ten meters. You know, it was um, just amazing. To, to hear all the signals popping in and out from, from Florida, from Georgia, from Texas, uh, um, and, and from Colorado. That was a real shocker. <laughs> that, was, that was really something. Um, so that, uh, that, that's what you can do with, with this when we get a meteor storm. And uh, of course, that was on single sideband, so things are a little bit different today, too. Anyway, so here's a list of, uh, of DX records uh, published by ARL um, on two meters. And you can see uh, K5UR and KP4EKG hold the distance record at uh, 3,162 uh, uh, kilometers on, uh, on two meters um, here in North America. And uh, and if you look down the list, you can see uh, you can see all the other distance uh, distant long distance contacts in there as well. So uh, they they again it takes uh, it takes a substantial uh, uh, system to be able to do this. You need high power, you need big antennas, and you need uh, a little bit of luck as well. So uh, uh, there's some opportunities there too with uh, with digital to push these distances out much further as well. And again, uh, you know, we had a big list for two meters and here's the 220 meg list and ND0B and K1OR have a 2260 uh, a kilometer distance uh, record on, uh, on 220, 222, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it uh, again the the list uh, the list gets a little shorter, and again, there's more opportunities to to push that further too. And 432, here's 432, and the distance records, uh, the number and the number of dis of distance applicants, and the number of and the distances have dropped substantially. So here you go, 2,040 kilometers. Uh, versus the, the original 1,000 mile, 1,641 kilometer uh, contact. So uh, again, you know, if, uh, if, somebody's, um, if somebody's really interested in, in, in that kind of thing uh, with big antennas and high power, you can, you can probably push that distance out further. But, uh, but that's where things stand at this point in time. Anyway, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the guys developed some uh, uh, high-speed CW activity in the 90s. And uh, um, this is an old picture from 2005 of, of WSJT. Um, and this is a setup running FSK441A. And um, I, I was running Meteor Scatter using this, uh, this software <laughs> on, a, on an old PC. Um, with I think 8K of RAM, I think I had a huge amount of memory on that on that thing. But but um, uh, we were able to work uh, work some some contacts out. Uh, BE1 UT and and myself used to run uh, two meter skeds on regularly, and I used to work Bernie all the time, and he was uh, he's about 900 kilometers from here, and we we could work uh, very easily. 
uh, K4 uh, KAE was down in the southern states and uh, he had uh, had a big signal up here too. So, um, and that this is sort of where the software started. The, the problem with FSK441 was um, you could get a lot of false decodes too. Um, and that, that has changed with uh, MSK144 um, and some of the newer stuff that, uh, that K1JTs come up with because they, they use error correcting techniques as well. So, so you get fewer false, uh, false decodes. Um, <clears throat> and here we go, like forward error correcting, uh, variable frame rates. Uh, you can you can um, you can change the frame rate on on MSK one forty four using the SH, clicking the SH box, which shortens down the uh, the um, the number of bits that are being sent. So you can take advantage of of those short meteor bursts. Uh, you can change the frequency tolerance, so you can you can you can adjust for Doppler, and um, and the stuff runs on the Mac. I'm I'm running it on a Mac. It'll run on Windows and run on Linux as well. Now you know, for random QSOs you can call CQ, um, but uh, but but if you really want to be effective with uh, with meteor scatter, you have to set up SCEDs um, on two meters. So so you would go on. Uh, on, on uh, ON4 KST or on Ping Jockey Central on, on the internet and uh, set up set up SCEDs. Back in the old days to set up SCEDs, we pick up the phone and call Charlie out in South Dakota and it's, you know, hey Charlie, you're gonna be around uh, August the 12th at six o'clock in the morning on 144, 150. And Charlie would say, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, oh, man, it's, that's three o'clock in the morning here. I, okay, well, you know, I'll see you there, you know, kind of thing. So, um, but uh, now we don't have to make phone calls or write letters to people. It's just a matter of getting, getting on on the internet, and making making uh, making instant contacts. It's like, okay, George, let's get on two twenty two one hundred in five minutes, you know, kind of thing. So, it, it, it's it's a lot more fun that way. Being able to to do these things in real time and set up skets and and, and know what frequency everybody's going to be on, so it, it's pretty neat that way. Um, so that's you know that's one of the joys of, of the the new uh, the new computer technologies. And of course, I think everybody here. I put this together last year, but I think everybody here um, has used is using. WSJT or JTDX uh, on FT8. And so this screen will look very familiar because this is the same, same software. Um, and, uh, and this is set up uh, uh, for Meteor, Meteor Scatter. Um, so the only, the only difference is it's a slightly different frequency um, and uh, and a slightly different uh, method of, of operating. Um, but, uh, but the rest of it's the same. You, you have sequences so that you transmit um, for 15 seconds and listen for 15 seconds and transmit for 15 and listen for 15. And that's, that's basically what we did with CW and sideband as well. So, so it's a direct, uh, direct um, development uh, fr from that technology. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's how how it how it looks, um, and uh, for effective meteor scatter on two meters, uh, you know, if you're just getting started, a single single six to ten element Yagi, fifty to two hundred watts, a laptop a transceiver in a quiet location is sort of the, you know, a good way to start. Um, if you're in the rock jockey class, you know, two or more Yagis and high power. Uh, and um, an ultra quiet location and all, you know, all makes, makes a huge difference. So operating in the city um, uh, can be quite a different experience from operating out in the country. And uh, I know the first time I went out in the country um, was, uh, was to operate uh, contesting from V3ONT and we were operating up in Claremont. And I got up there and set up the two meter station 
turned everything on and the S meter was sitting at zero. And I thought, geez, what's wrong? Something's wrong, you know? Like, and, and then gradually it dawned on me that there was no background noise. There were no power lines, no crap from, you know, from pagers or, you know, people's lawnmowers or that noisy car down the street. And it was like, holy cow, this is a whole different world. So, so there are two, basically two worlds. There's the urban environment where it's noisy and the, and the, and the country location. So probably same, same ideas as on HF, you know, the quieter, the better. So out, uh, out in the country, you can hear all those really small meteor bits coming in and in the city, you'll, you probably wouldn't hear them and you might hear, hear the bigger stuff coming in. So, so it'll make a difference, but Regardless, if you want to try it, just set up and, and give it a try and, and I guarantee that you'll be able to work, uh, work people. Um, and again, as I said, the mechanics of this is to set up a sched, set a date and time. Um, there's, there's the sequence, the rule for the sequencing is in North, in North America anyways, the Western station takes the first and third 15 second sequences. Um, and don't get me started about FT8 because <laughs> the Europeans do things the other way around. And when FT8 came along, it was like, okay, well, who's right? You know, so a uh, whole different ball game here. Um, now for contacts, if you're running on um, the agree, the whole idea of the contact is to exchange a signal report or some kind of agreed exchange. And that could be a grid square or signal report and, and an acknowledgement that you've received that agreed exchange. And that's usually Rogers or 73s. So um, again, if you're talking on ON4 KST or ping jockey, uh, the rule is not to say anything while you're running the sketch. So you can't go on there and say, hey, Charlie, yeah, yeah, I, I got your Rogers. Uh, or, you know, you're really loud here. I just got, you know, just keep quiet and just keep going till you finish. Um, and of course, uh, back in the old days, we would then make the contact and wait for the QSL card to arrive. Uh, today it's Logbook of the World. So you just upload to the Logbook of the World. Five minutes later, you download the, the um, confirmation. So it's, uh, you know, um, real time satisfaction, but you still don't. I, I, I still like getting the cards myself. And meteors, ultra quiet location. Well, here's, uh, here's one guy that likes to go out in ultra quiet locations. This is Peter ELE up in FO90 in, uh, in, in Quebec, uh, working meteor scatter. And uh, you can see here, he's got a uh, six, six element Yagi on the car and a couple hundred watts uh, in the car. And uh, he was just having a great time working stuff uh, from up there. Because again, the S meter wasn't moving. You know, looking out over water like that over the St. Lawrence, no interference, dead quiet. So you can hear all those little tiny bits of, of meteors coming in. So he would, he would typically say, well, you know, he's, he's copying me, no problem. Uh, how come you're having so much trouble copying me? And, you know, because I'm here in the city with all kinds of noise and and QRM and it, you know, it took a little, little longer to be able to work uh, uh, the DX pirate up there. So, uh, you know, there's, there's the screen and there's the, the Rogers uh, and the grid square. So pretty cool. Um, and typically uh, if you go on, <clears throat> on PSK reporter, you'll be able to see uh, who's hearing you and, 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 uh, and that same as on FT8. You can on PSK Reporter. You can change the mode and uh, there and, and and then see who's who's hearing you on what mode. So whether it's uh, you know MSK or FT8 or Q65 or some of these other modes, you can you can just click on them and it'll show you who's hearing you, <clears throat> which is uh, again a really handy tool to know if you're getting out or if there's if there's stuff there that uh, that's propagating your signal or not. So I mentioned ON4KST is a good place to go for, for sharing information, Ping Jockey Central and PSK Reporter. Um, 
Again, if you want to track the showers, Virgo, get, get a copy of Virgo. It runs on, uh, runs on every computer. Um, and, uh, and also there's another site called DX Maps um, run by EA6VQ. Uh, he makes a great uh, logging software program. And then he also runs this site that, that agglomerates all the, the uh, reports by VHF bands. Um, off the uh, off the cluster, so it's uh, again another great tool for seeing what's going on. Um, and don't be afraid to call CQ. You know, get on uh, get on the, uh, the the six meter or two meter calling frequencies and and call CQ and and you never know who's going to come back to you. Uh, here's a quick screenshot of um, of what's going on on. Uh, on some of these online uh, systems here, this is Ping Jockey Central. So you can see your, all the chats are going on here and people are making skeds or, uh, you know, um, working for, look, looking for different states or different grid squares to work. Uh, I don't think I've really touched on that, but there's a, you know, with, uh, when I first got on, on, on a meteor scatter with states, you know, that was, that was states or provinces. And then in the mid eighties, uh, the grid squares came in. Um, again, we, we borrowed the whole concept from the Europeans who had done some, something similar over there. And that generated activity because uh, ARL came up with the, the VUCC award. <clears throat> so uh, you can get a nice uh, piece of wallpaper if you work a hundred grids on, on six meters or two meters um, and, and somewhat fewer grids on the higher bands. So that stimulated activity. Uh, and uh, so, so that kicked a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, the activity on uh, on meteors uh, into high gear when we did that. Um, well, you know, because Ontario, for instance, you know, you work one guy in Ontario. Ontario is a thousand miles by a thousand miles, so you can work V3 KRP in Thunder Bay on meteor scatter, and it's still Ontario. Um, so. Or you can work, uh, you know, somebody in, in Winnipeg and, okay, that's, that's a new province. Um, but you work some of the other guys in Winnipeg, outside of Winnipeg and still the same province. But now with, with grid squares, um, you know, some of these guys are in rare locations, rare DX on the grid square table. So, uh, so it makes it uh, much more interesting. And here's, uh, here's an example of... Uh, meteor activity on, on six meters. Um, this is on PSK Reporter. And you can see all the guys that are working, different people all over the, uh, the East Coast here from all different locations. So um, uh, that's just an example of, of sort of typical, typical activity in, in April here last year. And here's an example, uh, give me a real quick, real time example of, uh, of a meteor scatter contact on, on MSK 144. And you can hear that, that burst comes through and, and there's your Rogers coming through on the screen. So that's what, uh, that's what it sounds like on, um, on, on two meters. Now, let me see, I've got to get to. Uh... Okay. That's a that's a purple wizard from K zero TPP, <clears throat> and um, and Rogers uh, seven threes from uh, K five OMC as well here, uh, out in Echo Mary forty four. So that's a, that's an example of uh, of of what can happen on uh, on two meters with some of these big big meteors. 
And here's a random contact with the Roger V1SKY out, out in the East Coast. And uh, this is on six meters. So the bursts are longer and Roger, Roger's got time to send in, uh, you know, thanks for the QSO kind of thing on, on uh, MSK. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's it. If you want to do, uh, do some digging around on the internet, here are some, uh, some links that uh, you might be able to uh, find some information on. Um, there's tons of stuff. Like when I put this presentation together, I was just boggled by the amount of information that's out there today. And uh, it continues to grow and, uh, and be shared around. So, you know, give it a try and, um, you know, uh, make a contact, uh, listen in, uh, maybe get up to the club station and get on from there. Um, and, uh, you never know what uh, what might just pop in on the uh, on the old screen there. Anyway, that's it. Uh, thanks very much, and um, I hope to hear you guys uh, hammering away on on the bands here, uh, uh, not only on meteors but uh, in the in the June contest as well. Thanks a lot. Well, Dan, thanks so much for putting all that together for us, and uh, we'll open up for a few questions here if you could take us for a few minutes. Sure, I have a question. Okay. Go ahead, Jim. I had heard there are weather balloons or weather devices, and they store data and they wait for meteor showers for them to transmit the data. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, out out west in in the U.S., uh, they have a network of uh, uh, they monitor the snow the snow depth levels um, in the Rocky Mountains. Wow. And uh, and they use a uh, they use meteor scatter to send that data back to the central location. So uh, yeah, you're right. That, that uh, that's definitely um, definitely been used for that kind of thing. Um, and that's not the uh, that's not the only uh, the only system that uh, that's operational. But uh, um, it, uh, it it's going today and then runs 24/7 during the particularly during the winter months, of course. Yeah, Rene, do you see your link here? Yeah. <laughs> well, I heard it, that I heard it was on 40 megahertz from Washington, D.C. That was a central station, and it was all with all the station west. And they were waiting for, it was a transmitter that was transmitting all the time. And when they will, they will see that the path is open, they will send back the, the data. That's what I heard it was uh, working. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, packet store and forward. Exactly. Yeah, but 40 megahertz isn't that far away from 50 megahertz. So, you know, it's um, sort of the same, the same concept we can we can use too. So any any other questions out there? Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, it's a little off topic, but Dana, what's uh, can you sort of talk very briefly about the difference between meteor scatter and um, and aurora? Uh huh. Um, okay. Well, meteor. You know, I've talked about meteor scatter. Yeah. And, and about aurora, um, as you know, the sun, uh, the the sun. We're 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 at the bottom of the sunspot cycle right now, but as we start up. As we start up through the um, this coming cycle 25, the sun's going to become more active, um, and and we've had a couple of cases where we've had HF blackouts. I don't know if you guys have noticed uh, last week um, and a few weeks ago there were blackouts on on HF, um, and those were caused by solar solar flare activity. And what happens with that is the sun, the sun will shoot a flare out, um, and uh, and that ionized gas stream will will connect with the Earth's magnetic field, and and if uh, if all things occur at the right the right um, the right way, 
it'll 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 create an aurora borealis in, in the sky in the northern northern sky um, and depending on how strong that stream is uh, we could get um, we could get aurora here in Toronto or actually it can move south of us here and um, and when that happens you you can bounce radio signals off the aurora because it's 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 at the same same rough altitude as the E layer um, and, and where all these meteors are burning up as well. Um, now, the thing is with, with the Aurora, the, uh, there's quite a Doppler shift put on the signal. So a, a CW signal won't have a T9 node. It'll have a, uh, it'll be modulated. It'll sound more like like that Shh, instead of a, you know, a, a nice clear tone like on 20 meters. Um, and, uh, and and that can produce uh, that can produce some long haul contacts as well out uh, out a thousand miles uh, on uh, on on two meters um, uh, and be and much further on six meters as well. We've been able to work across the uh, the pond on Aurora on six meters, um, <clears throat> and a few guys around here like B3FGU up in up in uh, FN04 um, back in 1986 got on and told everybody that he worked Hawaii on Aurora on six meters. And everybody was like, what? you know, like, what have you been drinking? You know, like, you can't do that. Then the QSL card arrived. Okay. And he said, I worked Hawaii. I was pointed north and, and I worked the KH6. Uh, and a couple of years later, Don B2DFO did the same thing. And I was listening at that point and I heard it as well. So it's real. So you can get some, some really strange propagation going on, on, uh, on six meters with Aurora. But again, uh, we haven't had that much lately. Like, like we're at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. So the sun's been really quiet and we don't get a lot of, uh, of, of storming, storming going on, but that's going to change. Um, and, and for the next, uh, two, three, four years, uh, we might, uh, we might be able to get some, some really good Aurora contacts in on, uh, on six meters, two meters and 222, uh, and, and even on 432. So, uh, so there's some more opportunity there to work DX as well. Um, and that's, you know, typically we used to say, well, when the HF bands go dead, get on six meters and point north. So, so there you go. You know, that's, uh, that's where things, uh, things are hopefully heading this, this solar cycle. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Well, just to mention that uh, once I was in the FN08, you know, in, uh, in Northwest Quebec, ah. I, I was on Aurora on 222 and I heard chip W1AIM. But it was so um, uh, well. It, it it went and it went it went by. So I, I was I wasn't able to make the contact. But I definitely heard W one AIM on two twenty two on Aurora. Yeah, I was up in uh, EN eighty six uh, in Elliott Lake uh, at uh, my friend Peter V three uh, EMSs uh, QTH uh, up there. He had uh, eight Yaggies on two twenty. This on two twenty megs. Um, and up there, he's behind the Aurora. So he showed me uh, to work, uh, work Aurora uh, from up there. He had to raise, he had, this was his moon bounce antenna system. He had to actually elevate the antennas about 10 degrees above the horizon. And suddenly the, the, the 220 Aurora signals just jumped up from, from nowhere. So, so it, uh, it just depends on where you are, I suppose. Uh, um, as far as uh, you know, what uh, if you have to elevate or point um, point in one direction or the other? The the weirdest um, the weirdest uh, two meter contact I had was with K zero MQS in in Iowa, and we were working on CW, and he, he had his typical ch -ch -ch -ch, you know signal modulated, <clears throat> and then suddenly the signal went clear, and it stayed clear for maybe uh, two minutes. So the, the level of ionization at that point must have gotten so intense that that um, 
that the Doppler shift uh, uh, or the angle the angle that the ionization was was in such a way that the Doppler shift disappeared. So that was uh, that was really strange, and it was like, what you know, what's going on? How come the what happened to the aurora? I can still hear you, you know, kind of thing. So uh, so there's all kinds of interesting stuff that goes on that we just don't necessarily know about because either there's nobody at the other end or you know you, you might have a station that's not in the right place so good thing today is we have more guys on here in Canada or across the north um, so we might be able to find some some other different aurora mechanisms uh, as the sun hopefully wakes up uh, over the next few years there was a, there was a station in the northwest the Northwest Territories, that's V-A-D-Y. We had a beacon on, on six meters, and I, I heard it sometime. And uh, and also up north, maybe they could have overall E, uh, the E uh, mm -hmm. layer propagation. I think it's, it's, it's east-west or after the aurora, but uh, I never seen that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, actually, that reminds me, uh, uh, a couple of the guys um, were up in uh, Iceland on uh, <clears throat> on six meters um, a few years ago, and uh, we were able to work them on aurora by skipping along the edge of the auroral curtain. So, uh, so we were just in the right place at the right time, and they suddenly popped up out of nowhere um, with with relatively clear signals and we're able to work them on on what, what what's known as auroral e um so uh, so that uh, that can happen and, and at other times so i i remember one night around midnight i was just sitting on fifth listening on 5125 with the antenna north northwest and the guys up in kl7 came through on, on auroral e just out of nowhere you know calling cq and uh um so, you know, there's, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that goes on. So, so, um, you know, again, if, uh, if the HF bands are really crappy and signals are really watery and you can't get out very far, 20 meters is dead and 80 meters sounds like everybody's talking inside a barrel, get on, get on six meters and up and, and she, you'll work, uh, you work some DX on Aurora. So there we go. Anyway, that's it for now. Uh, is, anybody else have any questions or, uh, Mm -hmm. It's uh, Lawrence V3HQM. You mentioned yeah. about the windy years in the Tobacco and you said he had that antenna. Was he on Amherst Drive? Is that where he's located? Sorry. Well, what... Amherst Drive on Rexdale there? Was that the fellow you were talking about? You said you had a friend on Tobacco had some. Oh, this is back uh, back in the uh, in the 60s. I live in Tobacco myself. Okay, now this guy was on Alhurst Drive. It would have been around 1970s. Alhurst, yeah. Um, the Wilson bus turned yeah, kind of. Uh, Helmet. Yeah, it was been there for years. Yeah. I think it was Helmet. Um, uh, I forget his call now, but he used to work for the ANC, just a nice Canadian. Okay. I met him once. I went up and introduced myself. But it was worked for the Metro way. Police. He had an EME uh, set up on two meters uh, in yeah. the back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if that's who you were talking about when you mentioned that. They just... No, this is one of the other guys, uh, uh, Larry V3CWT. He's a V2DO now. But um, he, uh, he, uh, I, was at, uh, I was at the West Side auction and I was telling, uh, telling him I was interested in, in two meters. And uh, he said, okay, well, look, you know, come over to my place and I'll show you all. All about and that that's it that that just did it that that caught my caught my fancy you know as far as working uh working vhf because he showed me how to he was like he was my elmer he showed me how to do it and then from there it was okay kid off you go you know so thank you yeah okay good thanks for reminding for bringing that up yeah you remember helmet jnc when he'd always got on the sky swatting it oh yeah yeah, V3 Sky, uh, Bruce used to do a swap net on Tuesdays, and Helmet always came on with something to sell. Just a nice Canadian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he'd phone me, he'd phone me up every once in a while and say, you know, 
yeah, it's Helmut, what's going on, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's a nice guy. Okay, any any other questions or are we, uh, we good? Okay, well, thanks guys, much appreciated. I hope I hope you learned something. I I hope uh, I've been able to impart a little bit uh, little bit of experience, and we'll look forward to uh, hearing some of you guys on here. Uh, I know Bob V three W Y and Peter E L E are on here, and uh, um, and uh, look forward to uh, the rest of you joining us up there, and Renee as well. So. You know, we look forward to the rest of you guys joining us up there on VHF. And uh, don't forget, there's a whole bunch of spectrum up above 50 megahertz that we have to occupy or we're going to lose it. So, you know, it's, um, and George, of course, George is uh, beating the drum on that issue uh, all the time. So, you know, good stuff. But but really, we, you know, this this helps get everybody active and, and, uh and activity breeds more activity, and then it, it also protects our bands. So, you know, by all means, uh, get on and and join the fun up there. Thanks a lot for uh, for inviting me in tonight. And, uh, um, hopefully, uh, the next presentation will be in person. So, well, that's what we're hoping for. That this is uh, <laughs> glued to your seat with uh, acne on your back from sitting in the chair all day long, even though you're 50. That's kind of driving me nuts these days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so guys, we'll leave the zoo open for five more minutes, but uh, that's the end of Dana's formal presentation. Thanks for all your time, Dana. Okay, my pleasure. Nice to see everybody. Oh, just, just one comment. I can, uh, as a DXCC checker, I can check the UCC if anybody gets cards. <clears throat> and Mike FGU, when he worked his 100th country, he called me on the phone and said, can I drive down to Toronto now? <laughs> and I had to put him off a day or two. And by the time I saw him, he was he was uh, not quite fully assembled, I guess would be the way to put it. But he was kind of excited. But he had, he had uh, literally he had his 100th, a single card that he wanted to be checked so he could get his DXCC. And of course, I know, Dana, you have yours on six as well. It's uh, it's a special thing. Yeah, I'm gonna have to drive over to your place, George. I've got uh, I've got one paper card uh, that I need to get checked. Um, so uh, so we'll be in touch. <laughs> yep. Well, who knows? If we get really lucky, maybe Field Day will still be on. Well, yeah, who knows? Oh, uh, and by the way, uh, I I can also do VUCC and WAS here as well. So, but not DXCC. So. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why they did it that way, but I can do all three. But oh, that's that's good. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, work I, the other way. I think uh, I think the rule is if you're on on the honor roll, you can check cards. Um, but uh, when I got started uh, back in when was that 1989? I guess it was. Uh, it was strictly uh, stri strictly WAS and VUCC. So. Yeah. At that point, I, I didn't care about DXCC at that point. <laughs> not, not until you started getting up into the 80s on uh, on six meters, and then all of a sudden it got real important. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm at 134 now, so mm. but, uh, I never expected that either. You know. Yeah. yeah. I, I was on vacation a few years ago in Malta, and there's a Maltese ham whose call I forget who wanted to arrange... Uh, for me to check his cards because he refused to put them in the mail. He had over 200 on six meters. That uh, 9H1BT? Probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think he was at 237 or something obscenely high, but he has a slight advantage in Malta in terms of being sort of in the center of the world. Well, you know, the Europeans, uh, there's something about Europe that... Uh, uh, the uh, propagation conditions over there are fundamentally different than here. Fundamentally, um, we're we're in the black hole here in North America <laughs> compared to them. Yeah, 
And we yeah. have to remember Toronto is actually in the middle of the continent almost in terms of propagation. The guys down in VE1 have a whole different trip. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you're in VE1 or in VO uh, or VO2, it's a whole different world over there. You can hear the Europeans on six meters with a wet string. <laughs> yeah, I have a tale to tell uh, about that. Uh, yeah, in, I think it was in 2019, 2018, uh, Peter, that we went to zone two. And yep. uh, we were with, a, a, you know, a halo uh, at 50, well, not at 50 feet, at 20 feet. And we made Svalbard on six meters. Yeah, with a halo. You, guys, you guys work Svalbard, you know, uh, on six meters with a halo. I mean, who does that? <laughs> that was that was something else. That was amazing. Peter <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's a there's a one guy that goes to Svalbard every year, I guess to to check the uh, to see how it's defrosting, and he gets on six meters from up there uh, yeah. every year. So uh, you know they 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 work some pretty interesting DX because the, the northern like that the polar region is a whole different ball game. Um, the, the polar guys uh, in the summertime, the, the, the northern part of the country is is in sunshine all all day and all night, basically. So you get a huge amount of ionization, and, and you know they, they, they work the E sevens from up there without any trouble at all over the pole, and um, and uh, you know all all, all uh, into Japan. They've had propagation into Japan from up there from Svalbard. Uh, VE7 land and you know we don't hear anything down here we're just like just sitting there watching this stuff whizzing by you know so uh, so and, and one quick question is that I have a friend it's Mark V2PN that he was stuck on the on the VHF net in, in Quebec City and uh, but he wanted to know if if the this presentation was uh, was taped uh, somehow so he can maybe look at it um yeah, yeah. Well, you know. it, it is actually it's it's being recorded. Okay, thank you. Good. If he needs anything, uh, just uh, let me know. I can send him the presentation as well. Okay, thank you. Is that Peter? No audio, Peter. Oh no! Turn your compressor on. Try two meters. <laughs> okay, is it on now? There we yeah. go. Five now. Okay. That's not. <laughs> hey, I can't believe you have that picture still with a pirate in uh, from that location. I told you I like that. I love that pirate picture. <laughs> worked Geddes, W A P Y A from there, and that was uh, just shy of 2,100 kilometers. And that wow. antenna was only at about 12 feet off the ground, and uh, it was seven elements um, and 250 watts. That's all I was using. The place was so quiet. I thought my antenna connection was actually broken because I couldn't hear any noise whatsoever. And uh, th well, that's unusual. I had the volume cranked up on full, and I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's quite unusual to actually uh, have something that, like that happen because over yeah, here I have the volume all the way down. It's fantastic. So we yeah. set up a remote station there. Oh, that, that would have been awesome. That was, uh, I think I only had about 70 kilometers left before the end of the road uh, when I got up to uh, FO90. I think it was Charlie Echo. And uh, if you want to go further past that point, well, past the extra 70 kilometers, you have to ferry over to uh, across the St. Lawrence over to the North Shore, right at the edge of Quebec. And then next ferry over takes you into uh, Newfoundland. That was pretty well at the end of the world, uh, well, where the road ends. Was that the night when you almost ran out of gas? No, no, no. That was the night that I got stuck in the sand and I was trying to uh, practice my French really hard to get some help to get pulled out of the... <laughs> it was literally quicksand with my <laughs> two-wheel drive. Ah. Yeah, I think uh, it was Rivero Tonnerre. I think it was the... Uh, the, the well, it's way far east. <laughs> I guess the, 
the downside of all that is uh, the bugs, right? Oh my God, don't even talk about <laughs> the bugs. I don't know if I have the video, but I'll see if I can find it and upload that one on YouTube, then I'll share it to the group. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah it was uh, pretty crazy up there in some of those locations. All you have to do is go north canoeing and you see all the indigenous people around there. The kids, teenagers look like they got mega active and you realize, no, it's actually 15 years of bug bites. <laughs> you know, oh. I remember uh, the year before I went up to uh, Radisson, Quebec. That's an uh, FO13 Tango Echo. And I came up to a camp now or uh, into a little, uh, I guess, a construction site. And I couldn't find the campground I was looking for. And uh, I came out of the out of my car. I was just wearing shorts and short sleeve shirt. And the guy, he looks at my plate. He sees Ontario. He says, you're not from around here. You need to put some clothes on. <laughs> Next thing I know, I was just swarmed by, by all these little biting bugs. And I was just swatting away. I couldn't keep up and swatting them all away. It was so bad up there. Well, I think they, some, the some of the bugs are so bad, they show up on radar. <laughs> Hey, where was that? Wasn't that in uh, California or something? It was. Uh, uh, was it in Ohio or someplace? Or no, uh, I thought it was the southwest coast somewhere. Yeah, I, yeah, it was somewhere. It was. It was like a cloud of bugs that showed up on, on radar. But uh, oh, by the way, we made we made uh, how much? One ninety kilometers on on twenty four gigahertz over water, uh, Peter. Yeah, yeah, that's right. One ninety. I, actually, I think it was 189.6 to be sure, but for some stupid reason, I can remember these numbers and I can't remember three items on the grocery list. Yeah, that, that was something we tried, me and Peter, we tried on 24 gigahertz. At first, it was like 100 something kilometers and Peter was going farther and farther. And so we made 190 and it said, well, in two hours, I could be at 220. So, and we waited and we couldn't do it. But uh, uh, at 190, it was a S9, I think uh, at 190 kilometers. But uh, you know, it, it's like a wall on 24 gigahertz. If we went a little far and it wouldn't work out. It was gone. Yeah. 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 Huh. I think the problem was every time we were getting to the further distance, I think that all the moisture from the, just came down too low and was making a blockage for us so too much yeah. absorption already change I, I could see that yeah so oh well well thanks dana for uh doing this presentation and uh hey. i think barry uh v4ma will be doing something about uh 432 and up and also uh a mixture with eme for uh i believe that's uh the 27th is that, that correct, mike that should be very interesting because uh, I've been in Barry's shack, and Barry's shack is something to behold. <laughs> Unbelievable. But uh... Well, with all this uh, zooming around, we're always willing to take visitors, especially when there's uh, exotic speakers, such as people who grow uh, all kinds of exotica coming out of the box du junk. So, uh, yes, come on around again, Dana. Okay, well. Good seeing everybody. So yeah. guys, I think yeah. we're going to wrap it here. Uh, we're heading towards 930. That's kind of stretching the meeting out to almost two hours. So I think Jeff's still kicking around here somewhere that uh, is the host. Uh, if he wants to do any final salutations before he closes it off. Oh, we're good here. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, guys. And uh, I just had a quick question. I had an email without mentioning any names, but uh, are there any uh, topics that I could possibly try and find some presentations on. I know it was mentioned to uh, get some HF uh, presentations. So uh, is there any certain topics that you guys are interested in that I should try to find the uh, presentations for? Would uh, would you like me to do the uh, the uh, DX 101 or, the, or, or that sort of thing again? I haven't done it for the club, I guess, for six, eight years. I have yeah, a no newbie problem. question. Go ahead. A newbie question, stringing a dipole, ballon or no ballon? Ballon. Well, I, sure. I, believe, I believe that, but lots of people don't. I thought it would be 
a very simple topic because I know at field day, the 80 meter crowd had just a dipole, no ballon at field day. That's, I'm well, just thinking of simple topics, that's all. That's, that's an interesting one. First of all, is it a ballon or is it a current choke? <laughs> okay, okay, you see now, that, see now the topic has some meat. Yes. And also remember in coax, you have a signal on the, in, on the inside conductor, a signal on the inside of the shield and another signal on the outside of the shield. Yeah, well, I mean, it would feel they were looking at the ballon and uh, the poor needle on my analyzer getting banged by the CW from 40 that the antenna was picking up. But I'm just thinking of a simple topic is so many people put up dipoles with no ballon and they say, I have no problems. And other people say, if you don't have a ballon, half your antenna is your coax. Well, everybody's right so far. <laughs> yeah, okay, anyway, I was just trying to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have quite a few newbies in the, in the club now, so it'd be nice to actually get some, uh, any basic uh, HF, even antennas, making your own, brewing your own, and uh, the ballon, no ballon uh, is a pretty good discussion as well. Just because I know yeah. I've experienced the difference between having a balen, wrapping up a bunch of coax into a ball, or actually getting the right parts and uh, the amount of interference it causes to your neighbors as well. Yeah. And also, you might want to have two current chokes, one at the feed point of the dipole and another one at your, uh, at your rig. Now we're getting complicated. <laughs> well, George, uh, how about we just slot you in for the... Uh, gen uh, January 10th, final meeting of the year for DX101 for George. January? You mean June 10th, not January. Sorry, June, so June, sorry, my brain is fried out here. June Jan 10th. January is way too far yeah, away yeah, to plan. Thanks. So June 10th I, for George. Talking well, DX101. See. Okay. And then everyone can get their thinking caps on and we'll start rattling uh, groups IO about August, about ideas for the fall. And Dipole could certainly be a candidate for it and a whole bunch of other ideas because you get some good ideas put out in September, then everyone can get them executed before your fingers freeze in November trying to put them up. Okay, folks, thanks so much. Maybe 7-3. 7-3, seven, three. Seven, three, everyone. 73. Good night, everybody. Hey, uh, quick question for HES. Yes. Hello, sir. I was reading on uh, Repeater Builder, and a guy talked about a problem they were having, they traced down to their lightning arrest door. And I never thought about checking that particular component. You know what? That's not a bad idea at all. I mean, it could be something that on a Tuesday, it's great. And Wednesday, uh, it decides to possibly be intermittent. Hmm. Well, it's maybe on my... You know, it's a little two-inch thing, but... Uh, it could... It, it's, it's in line with the antenna, so... Uh, on my next visit up, I'll bring, I know we have one or two brand new ones at the station. I'll, I'll, it's worth swapping it out just to try it. Get just as a whole, and my BMW. Thank you for getting the York Young Bay ramp open. <laughs> All right, folks. 7-3, everyone. Right. 73.